well, again everything just kind of falling together as far as prayers and psalms and songs and because I'm in the psalms this morning and the thing about psalms there's multiple different types of psalms we all know there's psalms of praise and there's psalms of thanksgiving there's psalms of wisdom there's psalms of uh, well they call it enthronement and there's some of these royal type things that really I don't know where those come from but and then there's two that are really prevalent and that is a psalm of lament and the other one is a psalm of imprecation now that's a big word but we know what a lament is when you're crying out to God in your pain and suffering well, we see that a lot in the psalms and they kind of go lament and imprecation or, or sometimes you can have both within the same psalm the psalm of imprecation is one where when, you, when you're crying out to God for him to strike down your enemies. David had a lot of those. And I mean literally getting, he gets real, some of them get really graphic. You know, and there's, some, there's a couple psalms about when, when uh, Judah went into exile. And so the, part, the psalmist is writing you know, a, a psalm of imprecation saying, Lord, do to them what they've done to us. You know, smash their children against the rocks. Literally, that's what it says. Bust their teeth out of their mouths. That's pretty graphic. But we got to understand, and I never really thought of this. In fact, this, the, we have our camp meeting last week, this past week up at Whitehall, and the speaker was talking about this. You know, God is, when he says cast all your cares upon him, that's what he wants you to, I mean, that includes our complaints and our cries and our pain. Because you know why? He can handle it. We can't. So if we could learn not to throw out our complaints to other people, first of all, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> they really don't. And second of all, they can't handle it. But God can handle it. No matter what they are. Even if it's to the point where, I mean, you think of Isaiah when he was like, not Isaiah, uh, Elijah. When he finally says, Lord, I've had enough. Kill me. Take my life. I can't take it anymore. That was for God's ears and God's ears only. Nobody else. You cry out and lament like that now, they'll be coming with the paddy wagon and, and taking you out in a straitjacket. I don't think they do that anymore. But anyways, you know what I mean. God's big enough. People, we aren't to handle that stuff. And so we're going to kind of look at one of those this morning uh, from David. It's Psalm 59. And I entitled this message from panic to praise. Because this starts out pretty panicky. And you know, it, basically it says the story of what's going on here. And so it's Psalm 59, starting in verse 1. It says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, regarding the time Saul sent soldiers to watch David's house in order to kill him. Pretty serious stuff. It's to be sung to the tune of Do Not Destroy. I don't know what that is. And that's the other thing psalms are. They're basically songs. He says, rescue me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who have come to destroy me. Rescue me from these criminals. Save me from these murderers. They have set an ambush for me. Fierce enemies are out there waiting, Lord, though I have not sinned or offended them. I've done nothing wrong, yet they prepare to attack me. Wake up. See what is happening and help me. O Lord God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, wake up and punish those hostile nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. They come out at night snarling like vicious dogs as they prowl the streets. Listen to the filth that comes from their mouths. Their words cut like swords. After all, who can hear us? They sneer. But Lord, you laugh at them. You scoff at all the hostile nations. You are my strength. I wait for you to rescue me. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. 
In his unfailing love, my God will stand with me. He will let me look down in triumph on all my enemies. Don't kill them, for my people soon forget such lessons. Stagger them with your power and bring them to their knees, O Lord, our shield. Because of the sinful things they say, because of the evil that is on their lips, let them be captured by their pride, their curses, and their lies. Destroy them in your anger. Wipe them out completely. Then the whole world will know that God reigns in Israel. My enemies come out at night for food, but go to sleep unsatisfied. That's a message in itself. But as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning I will sing with joy about your unfailing love, for you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. O oh, my strength to you I sing praises, for you, O oh God, are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for this day and this time, and we simply ask you to open up these words, these, these words of lament, these words of imprecation, uh, these words of, of protection. And Lord, just we, I just pray, Lord, that you would open us up to hear how it can help us today in our lives. So we put it into your hands. Open up the ears of the hearers this morning. That we may hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is David's problem? What is his solution? And how does any of it pertain to us today and relate to us? Because if it doesn't relate to us, why preach it? It needs to relate to us today. So that's what I want to look at this morning. So David's home is under surveillance. As King Saul looks to kill him, he was informed. You better get out. If you don't get out, you won't see the morning. They're coming to kill you. And it's really a nightmare situation. You think about it. The place of refuge and security becomes a place of anxiety and fear. You know, horror film directors, they use this scenario to great effect. There are movies out there like The Panic Room. And uh, there was another one, and I don't remember the name of it. All I can remember is this woman, she's downstairs. She keeps getting these phone calls. And so they finally put a tap on her phone. And she gets a phone call, and after the phone call, she gets another call from the people who have the phone tapped, and they say, the call's coming from within your house. Get out. The thing we fear most invades our home. So how can you survive such a situation? Well, this psalm moves between descriptions of the psalmist's situation, looks, which look very dire, really sound desperate and hopeless. That's how it starts out. They have set an ambush for me. Fierce enemies are out there to waiting, Lord. They come out at night snarling like vicious dogs as they prowl the streets. Listen to the filth that comes out from their mouths. Boy, all you got to do is turn on the TV and the people that come against God's people today, you hear, you hear the filth coming out of their mouth because they are vile people. Their words cut like swords. After all, who can hear us? They sneer. And then here's this, my, my, verse 14 and 15. My enemies come out at night snarling like vicious dogs as they prowl the streets. They scavenge for food but go to sleep unsatisfied. How that can preach in itself is sin never satisfies. No matter how much you do it, no matter how much you indulge in it, there is no satisfaction in it. And so you keep indulging in it more and more and more, thinking that this time it's going to satisfy you. And it never does. It never does. It's kind of like drugs. you got to keep taking more and more, trying to reach what you had before. But then we see David's developing response, where we see his faith and his confidence grow. Verses 1 through 5, you can almost hear the panic in his voice as he fuels a prayer of protection, of rescue, and of response from the Lord. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who have come to destroy. Rescue me from these criminals. Save me from these murderers. They've set an ambush for me. They're out there waiting, Lord. I've done nothing. I've done nothing wrong. And yet they're prepared to attack me. And then he's crying, which says something kind of silly. But, and that's wake up. Because we serve a God who never slumbers or sleeps. Wake up! See what is happening. Help me! Wake up and punish those hostile nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. 
And really, they weren't hostile nations. They were his own people. It wasn't a wicked nation. It was the people of Israel. Under the, the king Saul, who was his father-in-law, who was jealous of David. And yet he knew that David was anointed king to be one day. He knew that his kingdom was taken away from him. And yet it, what, it wasn't going to happen for many, many, many years. So he wasn't fighting against David. He was fighting against God. And it cost him. It actually cost him and his whole family. Jonathan, who was one of the good guys in this whole family, who was, was such a good friend of jo uh, David, ended up falling in battle and being killed because of the sins of his father. So like a hunted animal, David cries out to God. Often our fears can cut us off from God. That's the sad thing. Our fears should make us run to God, but often they cause us to pull away from him. And we're isol you know, isolating us in a, in a world of worry and anxiety, which does nobody any good. We know what stress and anxiety can do to a person. I mean, physically due to a person, not alone emotionally and spiritually. It can, it'll destroy somebody. But wait, when we express that outwardly, and that's what he's doing in this psalm, he's expressing it outwardly, not to anybody else, but to God. He's, he's crying out to God and God alone. When we do that, our fears become fuel for prayer. And it is that state of prayer where we realize that our God is still on the throne and he's still in control. David then realizes that while he's under surveillance by his enemies who wish to do him harm, God's doing his own surveillance. He's surveying the, survey, the ones that are surveying, surveilling him. God's watching them. He's watching everyone, and that is he is in complete control. And in that control, he laughs at the plans of the ungodly. I like that. But Lord, you laugh at them. You scoff at all the hostile nations. The nation, what's the, another one that says? The nations rage in vain. The, the, any nation that stands up against God, they do it in vain because God's in control. You, you know, you think of all those nations down through the history of the world. Egypt, who was unbelievably mighty in their time until the Israelites got down there. God used the Egyptians, but then he turned against them to punish them for what they did to his people. The Assyrian Empire, and the next great world power, who took the northern kingdom of Israel into exile, which they deserve because of their sin. God eventually destroyed them. And then Babylon, who may have been the greatest of them all in that first one, that first part of the early history of man, you know, he used them as his hammer against the Israelites and the rest of the surrounding countries because of their sin. He used them as his arm of punishment. But he also said, right, at the same time, he says, and this is my paraphrase, but your days are coming, Babylon. He says, everything you've done to these people, I'm going to do it and do it worse to you. And they did. And then in comes the old Mede, Mede of Persian Empire. And he was behind that and strengthened them for a while. And he used them as the, ar you know, the arm of God. He used them to actually bring the Israelites back from exile. And then after that, the Greeks, this started getting worse and worse, really, when you think about it. But in the Greeks, it brought a lot of, brought a lot of uh, what do you want to say, uh, knowledge. It brought a lot of wisdom. It brought a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of things good with the Greek Empire other than the fact that it was a, they were all vile and then after that came the worst of them all which was the Roman Empire but God used them to bring forth the Messiah when they built all these roads from all over the world so that people could get to Rome in the center of Rome man didn't do that they think they did but it was God who was forming and shaping history, which I've used before. History is his story. That's what history is, the story of God. From beginning to end, history.
You scoff at all the hostile nations. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance. But the Lord just laughs. For he sees their day of judgment coming. And that's why he can laugh. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and oppressed. To slaughter those who do right. But their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Psalm 37, 12-15. Another psalm of lament and imprecation. <coughs> but we got to understand that that deliverance that they're talking about and that their day is coming, there's still going to be a lot of hardship there's still going to be a lot of death and destruction until that time comes. A lot of oppression. We've seen all of those, those great empires. They enslaved people like by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands for their own bidding. So some of them did not see that deliverance until they went on to the next life. In other words, they may very well have lost their life because of of the oppression going on. So it doesn't always happen all at once. And we're still seeing that today. There's still still people today dying every day for the sake of Christ around the world. So he will watch for God, David. His David will watch for God, his deliverer, with the same level of attentiveness with which his enemies look to uh, for an opportunity to attack him. We start to see it now. Verses 9 and 10. You are my strength. I wait for you to rescue me. For you, O God, are my fortress. In his unfailing love, my God will stand with me. He will let me look down and triumph on all my enemies. Again, sometimes those enemies take your life. But you're standing in the ramparts of glory, looking down in triumph. Even at that moment, over your enemies. So let's bring it to us today and ask the question, what or who is looking for an opportunity to attack you? Have you felt like David in that you feel as if your enemies are closing in for the kill and there seems to be no way out and no relief in sight for whatever it is that has come against you? And, and it doesn't have to be a literal enemy. I mean as in a person or a group or a group of people. But it can come to us as problems, trials, tribulations, temptations. And whether they be physical, emotional, or spiritual. Now granted, to be fair, none of us have been ordained to be the future king of a nation. Like David was. As a young man. A young teen. So the, so the now king was jealous and distrustful of him. His son-in-law, you know, and his, his, his daughter, his, my, David's wife was saying, Father, that, that, that's not right. David's not that guy. His son, Jonathan, it's not, that's, you're, it's all in your mind. That's not David. And we see how warped he was where he tried to impale his own son with a spear after he told him that. He was just gone. So now the king is jealous and distrustful of David and his motives, and they were pure. They were, as they, the, David, they were pure. Now, we may not be ordained to be kings of a nation, but make no mistake about it, we have been ordained by God to be kings and priests. And we'll add in there queens for you ladies in his kingdom which is spiritual and eternal Revelation 1 5b and verses 6 to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen and then Revelation 5 9 and 10 and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth and since all of us who have been washed in the blood 
the blood of the Lamb have been saved, born again, and have been called kings and priests in his kingdom, then we truly do have an enemy who despises us so much that he will do anything to ambush us, to attack us, to destroy us, if we give him the chance. Which we do when we allow ourselves to get caught back up into the concern and concern ourselves with the things and the worries and the cares of this world. We give him the opportunity to get a foothold. I'm talking about Satan. Satan absolutely hates the fact that we no longer belong to him. And no matter what you think, every one of us at some time in your life growing up, you belonged to him. Before you came to Christ, you belonged to Satan. He was your spiritual father. That's just the way it was. You might not have bowed down and worshipped him. It didn't matter. You belonged to him. But as you were redeemed and you were bought at a great price, you now belong to another master, God Almighty. And Satan don't like that. He, dis he, he despises that. And you know what else he all, because we did belong to him at one point, guess what he knows about us? He knows absolutely, he knows absolutely it knows our weaknesses. And he knows where we live. He knows our weaknesses, and that's what he tempts us with. Now, your weakness and temptation may be different from mine, but it doesn't matter. He knows what they are. He's not omniscient, and he doesn't all knowing, but he knows enough that when we belong to him, he knows what it was and what it is. And what does he always hit us with? Whatever we are weak at, that's what he tries to hit us with. You know, it's, it's no different than what King Saul was trying to find and do and find and destroy David. Because he knew David's, because he lived, David lived there. He was in the family. He knew David. He knew David's habits. And he tried to use them against David. Thankfully, David had one, capital O, on his side that knew more than Saul did. Hey, folks, we have also have one on our side that knows and sees more than the devil ever can hope to do. And we need to make sure that just like David, in the midst of our trials and our tribulations and our temptations, we cry out to God and know that he can and he will deliver us from our enemies, whether in this world or the next. Because we need to understand that sometimes our deliverance, like I said, won't come on this side of glory. But that doesn't mean that God wasn't faithful to us or that he wasn't watching over us. I think of the story that just came to mind of, uh, oh, what was, now I'm trying to think of his name. Who was the German pastor during World War II? Was imprisoned. Ah, I can see his face. Yes. What was it? Say it. Bonhoeffer. Yes. He was in prison because he spoke out against Defur. And it looked like he was going to be, they were going to get on a truck and he was going to be, you know, the war was almost over. And he was going to be released. And yet they pulled him back off of that truck and they marched him out completely naked and hanged him in the square. I mean, just weeks before the end of the war. But yet that was a victory for him. It was a victory. Sometimes our deliverance won't come on this side of glory. But that doesn't mean that God wasn't faithful to us or that he wasn't watching over us. Now, and the perfect example of this was one of the great stories of the Bible, great miracles, was of the three young Hebrew men who stood up against the most powerful earthly king of that day, Nebuchadnezzar. 
And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And after they were saved, you got you got to bow down to this gold statue, guys. Or I'm going to throw you in the furnace. And I love what they said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Well, that just set off Nebuchadnezzar. He went apoplectic. Seven times he heated the old furnace up with that fire. So hot that they bound those guys to throw. And the guys that threw them in were killed. That's how hot that play, furnace was. But then we know the rest of the story. He rushes down and looks down in and he sees four people down in the fire, not three. And he says, one looks like a god or a son of God. And it was. It was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ that was in the fire with them. And he called them out and there wasn't even a... Nothing was singed, nothing even smelled. You, you can't... I was talking this week when you're at camp. You can't build a campfire and be sitting around it and being three feet away from it without smelling like smoke. Because you know what they say, smoke always falls beauty and somehow it always finds me. <laughs> but isn't that not true? And yet there these guys are thrown into a thousands of degrees and they walked out. Now you say God did deliver them. Yes, he did, but he delivered them back into bondage. They think about that. God indeed rescued them from the flames and the power and life and death that Nebuchadnezzar held over them, and they were held in high esteem after that, but they were still in bondage. Their ultimate deliverance and freedom from the bondage of Babylon didn't really come until they went on to paradise themselves. That's when the, finally the freedom came. Likewise, we still come under attack from Satan and his minions in this life. And God may choose to deliver us from those earthly situations, but even if he doesn't, as long as we remain faithful to him, and that's the key, he will remain faithful to us and ultimately deliver us from the evil of this world as he welcomes us into the next. So let us make sure that we don't give the devil any added ammunition to use against us by not being the men and women of God that he has commanded us to be. Let us make sure that we are walking in and by his spirit every day and we're putting on his armor every day and we're taking up our crosses every day to follow him. We do those things. We can be sure that he will deliver us from this world and welcome us into the next. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day and this time, and we just ask, Lord, as we're going to sing this song, that you would speak to your people this morning. If there's something that someone needs to share, someone that needs to pray about, I ask, Lord, you just move them to come to the front pews, and we will pray for them. Or, Lord, just where they're at, just let them recommit let them you know re uh, refocus their lives this morning knowing that you do hear you do deliver you do rescue you're still in that all in that business and we we look forward to lord that final rescue one day so be with us now lord as we sing this song and we'll give you the praise and glory in jesus name amen what's the number